Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Skip Rutherford. I'm dean of the Clinton School. And welcome to one of the most important weeks in American and Arkansas history. Thank you all for being here. Uh, in today's program, um, kicks off what will begin uh, at midnight tonight. Two things will happen. Number one, it looks like the government's going to shut down, the federal government. Number two, uh, www.healthcare.gov goes live in terms of the Affordable Care Act. One point of things to say is that regardless of what happens with the federal government tonight, and I have no clue, by the way, uh, <laughs> thankfully, um, the enrollment informational fair will take place tomorrow at 10 a.m. from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m., completely independent funding, so it will take place. So it is on. So regardless of what happens, we're here and the enrollment fair is taking place. If I could ask if you would turn your cell phones and other electronic devices off, tend to interfere with our cameras. And uh, we're very honored to have this panel today. We're very honored to partner with the Arkansas Insurance Department uh, as, we, as we talk about, again, what I think uh, is a very important issue, one very personal to me because you know, one of the aspects about being dean of the Clinton School is that you have the opportunity to work with very talented graduate students, uh, but uh, over the years, many of whom uh, did not have access to or could not afford health care insurance. And we're dealing with a lot of students who have some pre-existing conditions. So tomorrow is a very big day. I might also add that in our new class, for the first time, we've been able to see that a significant portion of our students a significant portion of our students under the age of 26, thanks to the Affordable Care Act, are on their parents' insurance. And that is making a big difference with this class. And it's the first time we've been able to, to have that good news. Uh, and so it's very important. To uh, introduce our program today is a distinguished Clinton School graduate from our very first class. Malcolm Glover uh, is on the news team at KUAR. Many of you have probably heard him, seen him, met him. He produced the award-winning series Impact of War, uh, and he appears regularly uh, on Arkansas Week on AETN. Uh, when he was uh, at the Clinton School, he, he did a very, or created a very powerful documentary about his work uh, in Sudan, uh, which, was, which, which was very, very uh, challenging and very creative on his part. He's currently completing, uh, working on his PhD at the University of Central Arkansas. Uh, and he's really one of the great talents and one of our most distinguished alums. Please welcome Clinton School graduate, Malcolm Glover. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming uh, to this lunchtime discussion where we are going to talk about the insurance marketplace. So let's start with just brief background information on what's happened over the last few days. And of course, we're going to introduce our panelists after that. Last Friday, Arkansas became the first state to win federal approval to use Medicaid funds to purchase private insurance for thousands of low-income residents under the federal health care law. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services approved the state's request to implement a private option plan, and now several other states are looking toward Arkansas's plan to try to do some of what we've done here. Now, of course, two days ago on Capitol Hill, Arkansas's four members of the U.S. House of Representatives voted for a resolution that would temporarily fund the federal government while delaying implementation of the federal health care law. But back here in Arkansas, things move forward. And officials are preparing to implement a key part of the federal health care law with the launch of an online insurance marketplace. And of course, there will be an event here at the Clinton School of Public Service tomorrow to explain to people those plans and those options. That's going to be here at the Clinton School of Public Service tomorrow. So our panel, Joe Thompson, Arkansas's Surgeon General, 
Cindy Crone, Insurance Deputy Commissioner of the Arkansas Health Connector, and Andy Allison, Director of Arkansas's Department of Human Services. We thank you all for being here this afternoon. And we want you all to begin not only talking about how you fit into the grand scheme of this uh, insurance marketplace, but some of your chief concerns moving forward with tomorrow being such a big day. Thank you, and thanks for inviting us here. Uh, I'm Joe Thompson. I serve as the director of the Arkansas Center for Health Improvement, and, and along with, with Andy and Cindy and, and their bosses, John Seeley and Commissioner Bradford on the governor's cabinet, uh, where we've been developing our health care strategy over the last uh, four or five years. I'd like to just take us back. Our health care system was on the verge of collapse because of the rising, rising rates of health insurance, healthy people exiting the market, sick people staying in the market, and the fact that we were impending on a collapse of our insurance market. We have 25% of our Kansans that do not have health insurance coverage between 19 and 64 years of age. And, and our health care system was really on the brink. Tomorrow represents the first day <clears throat> of an opportunity for that 25 percent to enroll and get coverage. It's not the most important day. The most important day really is probably around December 15th because coverage starts on January 1st. So tomorrow is the first day that we start recruiting people in to sign up. December 15th is the important day so that we maximize, optimize people's coverage. March 31st is the last day that they can sign up for this year. So we now are firing a shot tomorrow to try to get as many of 500, 550,000 Arkansans who today don't have health insurance coverage tomorrow. Now, what I'm most concerned about, uh, we've got a lot of concerns that this group is trying to manage, some of them in our control, some of them not. We don't know exactly what's going to happen when the federal government flips that switch tonight at midnight. Uh, it will have some bumps, we're sure. They'll iron them out quickly, we're fairly confident. Uh, there will be a little bit of a break at the first of people who go to the federal exchange who should end up on the private option or people who come through the private option door who really should be up on the federal exchange. So we'll have a little bit of a gap until we can make that seamless. Uh, the other thing that I'm most concerned about probably is that we are starting to have some of the Washington vitriol and partisan politics take effect. Uh, Cindy and I are late and we're late starting this morning because of a review committee uh, in the Arkansas General Assembly, which denied the outreach and education efforts of the Insurance Commission uh, this morning. Um, some of you have heard, seen the Get Insured commercials that I think are fairly effective at mobilizing folks to get in. Some of you have also probably heard the 800 numbers to call for insurance. I called, actually, I heard three of those in 30 minutes on the radio last week. I called. I got a nice young woman who started asking me for my name, for my social security number. I gave her my son's name, but then I started thinking, I better give some more fictitious stuff. So I may have given her one of y'all's social security number. <laughs> Address. Uh, then she started asking about my conditions. What illnesses did I have? What drugs was I on? And I said, well, don't we, aren't we getting rid of these pre-existing conditions? And she said, well, those plans aren't available until January 1st. You'll have to call back after January 1st if you want those plans. I can give you the plans that we have today between now and January 1st. And I said, well, where are you? She goes, Illinois. And I said, are you a licensed agent? She said, no. So again, the importance of getting the message out about people truly having choice, having objective basic insurance that is legitimate and credible is going to be up to the voices of you and your friends and your networks. Uh, and hopefully we'll convince the legislators to consider some advertising to counter what is, I believe, somewhat fraudulent, if not explicitly fraudulent, efforts uh, on the airwaves. So that's my biggest concern. I look forward to our conversation discussion. Andy is going to lead with, and I just want to say, this is a historic moment for the U.S. Medicaid program. They have never done what they said Arkansas could do on Friday, and we would not have Friday if it hadn't been for a bipartisan effort last year. So I don't want to say that it's partisan to start with. I just want to say we're having some leakage of the Washington vitriol that we need to, to uh, keep from happening. Andy? Thank you, Dr. Thompson. Uh, this is truly a, an historic week, I, understanding that, that tomorrow isn't the most important day in the process of implementing the private option, what's come to be known as the private option. Uh, that day you could, you could say is December 15th when, when enrollments begin to lock down for uh, January 1st. I think you could point back to April 23rd when the governor signed uh, 
essentially the most bipartisan sweeping health care, true health care reform bill uh, that I'm aware of in this country, including uh, the Affordable Care Act um, uh, here in Little Rock. Uh, but I think you could also point to Friday for the approval by the federal government uh, in a couple of ways, uh, an unprecedented uh, program. Uh, number one, it is the use of uh, federal and state funding to buy private insurance. No caveats, no add-on sentence, no run-on uh, limitations private insurance for those who are under 138% of poverty who right now in the state of Arkansas are not eligible for help really of any kind to purchase insurance that uh, rivals their annual income in cost. Uh, that's, a, that's a tremendous achievement uh, in uh, accessibility for those individuals, but also a model of coverage that the country hasn't seen. You remember that this country essentially began to split apart politically uh, over this bill and over, in particular, the aspect of this, um, of the debate known as the public option. Do you remember the public option? The public option was essentially the extension of, of Medicaid into the private insurance market to directly compete with it. The private option is aptly named, it is the opposite. It is the use of Medicaid or public funding to buy literally private coverage, not to compete with it. In fact, to enhance that marketplace by putting um, upwards of a quarter million consistently funded, consistently participating individuals into the individual private insurance marketplace of this state. That is exactly what you would want to do if you want more competition, more players, more insurers, uh, and more consistently covered lives in the state of Arkansas, regardless of income. Uh, so it's, it's a tremendous achievement, the first of its kind, and so many states are looking uh, at it. Having said all of that, and as big and as sweeping a change and important as it is, the waiver itself is right here. It's just that big. The ideas are enormous, the impact is enormous. But the second aspect of this that's remarkable is how quickly it came together. The governor signing this bill uh, on April uh, 23rd, providing new guidance uh, through the insurance department. Cindy and I, <laughs> Commissioner Joe, we've all become uh, best friends uh, in a very, very short amount of time. Um, and and it, was, it was not easy uh, to create in just a few months, even in po not only in policy, but operationally, what was originally envisioned as a three to four year process, this bill at the federal level passed in the spring of 2010. We have done all this since even later in the spring of this year and are now uh, poised uh, to begin and, and are ready to go. I, I, would, I would thank my own staff, who's here, Suzanne Bierman, um, uh, Bashrat Bragamova, and others. I know so many at the state level put this together and I saw at the federal level, and I've been in the Medicaid business for a long time, beginning at the federal level, reviewing waivers, at least in form, like this uh, in the early 90s. I'm not aware of, nor have I ever seen, the kind of response and um, partnership and teamwork that has existed since the first calls were made, even before the legislative debate began here in Little Rock in the spring. And those calls have not stopped right up until the final moments on, on, uh, on Friday when this, when this came together. So uh, my hat's off to, uh, to the team here, to the state for coming together. Uh, this, this doesn't happen very often, uh, and uh, I'm really glad to have been a part of it. Thank you. Well, it is a very exciting time. Tomorrow is a big day we have all waited for, and I come into this as a nurse. And so I have been waiting to get this half million uncovered lives covered because we have some of the worst health indicators in the nation. And we know that when people have coverage and can access care that they will do better and they'll be healthier and our costs will not only not rise but will come down in the long run. So this is like a potential dream um, that 
now all eyes are on Arkansas. Who would have thought? So in a way that we can keep healthcare local, keep our hospitals open, get healthcare providers paid the same rate for our lowest income, Medicaid and other uh, consumers, it's a win, 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 win. It's a win for our economy overall by millions of dollars of economic benefit. For the consumer, most of all, they can get health care and become healthier. Uh, for our providers who get paid at the same rate, for our insurance companies who have more covered lives. Working together, you know, what, what do all these things mean? Well, having the private option is so important for consumers because it means that as people's income changes, which it does and will, particularly now we're at this cut of 138% of the poverty level, they can keep their same provider network, they can keep their same uh, health care plan, they don't have to move, just the payer or the payer mix changes. So our people have continuity of care, our health care facilities stay open, and it really is a good thing. Instead of being the bottom will be the top, we're the top in innovation. Uh, we're the top in working together as a system. Um, have disappointments, yes. We just came from one big one uh, that Dr. Thompson mentioned. Uh, from what I think is a very good ad campaign, but now that needs to move to action. So people know enrollment time is here. How do I do that? We have an incredible staff that's put together guides on the ground, navigators on the ground, insurance agents by the thousands responding, hospitals and healthcare facilities putting in what are called certified application counselors. So we will have thousands of people trained, licensed, and ready to help our Kansans, which is a very difficult decision um, to enroll and how to enroll, and how to choose among now choices that you have. So why is December 15th, uh, both of these gentlemen have talked about that date, why is it so important? The first day coverage can begin is January 1, 14. You must enroll by December 15th, 13, to have coverage effective January 1, 14. For many, many people who have never been able to have coverage before, they have not been in, they've been kept out. So it's an important day. History tells us people will wait till the last minute. Medicare Part D, uh, other times, they'll wait till the last week to enroll, but what they've missed out on is three months of coverage for health care being able to get wellness services at no cost to the consumer, being able to access health and maybe even save their lives. So I hope people will get in now, uh, shop, become informed, but make that December 15th date. And, and for the listening audience, why that's important, you've done insurance, hopefully many of you in this room. If you enroll by the 15th of the month, your coverage begins the first of the following month. If you enroll after the 15th, it's the first two months out. So December 15th, January 1, when you're first eligible. December 16th, February 1. So I'm sure we'll have questions, but I bring to you the uh, people's voice in how we can best protect our consumers, get rates that are affordable, and get quality care for our Kansans that we all deserve. I know there are going to be questions from the audience, and so as the panel answers some questions from me first and then the audience, uh, feel free to decide which one of you might be best suited to answer the question so we can move things along. Uh, another important date that I've heard a lot about is March 31st, which is on that date, you're subject to federal fines if you have not gotten the insurance that you need. And so I'm wondering what if anything is being done? We, we've heard about the Get In Media campaign. We've also heard about the work of the navigators. But um, how are we making sure that particularly in rural areas of Arkansas, um, where we still have issues with internet connectivity, people are understanding every aspect of the marketplace and the importance of signing up? Well, we have, um, as I said, hundreds of trained people on the ground. We have community-based organizations helping to get the word out. There's a federal call center open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 150 languages to begin to answer questions and inform. 
But I do think there's been a lot of misinformation, and so it's really all of our responsibility to get the word out, talk in your groups, talk in your churches, begin to be sure people have accurate information. Yes, there are penalties. Um, they're not very much the first year. It's $95 per adult in a household, and half that for each child of the first three or 1% of your income, it quickly goes up to next year $325 per adult, then it goes up to $695 per adult plus half for children, and you don't have insurance coverage. So with a sliding scale fee, with help to make coverage affordable for many, many in Arkansas, people should not have to worry about penalties. They should be able to get coverage. So I think it is incumbent on all of us, those hired and those volunteers. We have an army of volunteer Speakers Bureau people letting the citizens of this state know. So let's all work together to help everyone know that the choice is coverage and not penalty. The other thing that we're adding is the uh, clinics for the health department are helping mobilize to get people coverage. So places that we have touched people without health insurance, trying to encourage them to seek health insurance, as well as you may see somebody when you uh, get your license plate renewed. Uh, so we're trying to use all the state avenues, but we really do need private sector and other nonprofits, the, the faith-based leaders, to really help get the word out that now is the time to take action. I might add one other piece, and I think most of you, if you're business owners, know this, or if your employees have received it, but by October 1, a letter must go to all employees of companies with two or more people, so most, letting people know that this is available, what their obligations and responsibilities are, and that there is a marketplace, but how they might be better served in continuing with their employer-based coverage. So. More and more, um, through your employer, through your neighborhood, the word should get out. You know, we had a debate in this country. Uh, we, can, we can debate how engaged that discussion was and how engaged each of us were in that discussion in 2009 and 2010 over um, mandates, the individual mandate, the employer mandate. This is really a question of responsibility. We talked a lot about the responsibility, you've heard about it, the responsibility for coverage, the individual and personal responsibility um, to take advantage of what is now affordable uh, so that society does not bear the burden of, of uh, paying for your care uh, if you need it. But if I could add to that, uh, we are building, in the process of building, it may not be tomorrow the most user-friendly and seamless system, but it will be. It's being built that way. And I would just add to that the question of our social and, and individual responsibility to help others know about this rule, get enrolled. Uh, not everyone has access or can, uh, has the facility to use access to the websites that we're putting in place, but this is not a county-based social program. This is private insurance and it's accessed the way we informa access information today, or at least those many of us in this room. So I just add to that personal and, and, and collective responsibility to have insurance, now really a new model for helping others to get uh, enrolled and, and, and gain access. Can a business, particularly a small business, opt out of its current coverage before the cycle is up uh, to then get coverage through the insurance marketplace? Uh, first, a small business by our state's divine, def defined as 50 or fewer employees, or under 50 actually. And so there's no requirement for those small businesses with 50 or fewer to provide coverage to their people. They are eligible to shop in the shop, which stands for Small Business Health Options Program. And so they have an opportunity, which can bring with it opportunities for tax credits as well as deductions and getting their employees covered. After the first year, it will be a more robust private market shop marketplace. But this year, those with more than 50 must provide coverage. They will not be penalized in the first year because the reporting has been given a one-year grace period. Uh, we don't think that we'll see employers doing a lot different because I don't think people will stop 
providing coverage to start it again next year. But it's a time to educate, to understand, and to work the systems and the reporting that will be required next year. So long answer short, no requirement under 50, opportunities to shop in the new marketplace with 50 or fewer employees, and requirements, but no penalties in 2014. And I might just add, 95 percent of all businesses in the state of Arkansas have 50 or fewer employees. So 95 percent of all businesses have to do nothing other than notice their individuals that they have an option in the marketplace. I think that's one of the misinformations that has been out there that I just want to make sure you have accurately. The other 5 percent have some obligation. The larger employers have the most obligation. But 95 percent of Arkansas businesses have no obligation to offer or to have a penalty or uh, anything else. And I might add with the new private option, those at the lowest income who would be eligible under 138 percent of the federal poverty level can purchase through the exchange a private plan with premiums paid by Medicaid and over 100 percent they'll have some cost sharing but that is at no penalty to the employer, large or small. So this is an option where the employer will not be paying any of the premium, they will not be penalized, and the employee can be covered. And I think many of us have heard a lot about those percentages. I'm wondering, uh, how much do you have to make, basically, in order to have full subsidized coverage or partial coverage? Do we know that? <laughs> We don't have the sheets in front of us, and we don't want to get that wrong. Uh, so a couple of things. One, for, for a, a family of one, 138% uh, of poverty is around $15,500, uh, about $15,500. And then with additional children, the amounts, the amounts would go up, uh, go up from there. So a family of four is about $32,000. Uh, $32,000. So compared to, for example, the price of a, of a full family insurance premium, which is $1,200, $1,400 a month, you're looking at a meaningful percentage of, 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 of pay. I think it's rate. important. It's family income that determines your tax credit, not an indiv unless you're a family of one. I mean, it's your family income which will determine how much on a sliding scale the federal government advances you money, it's an advanced tax credit, to buy down the premiums. Uh, for those that are just above 138 percent, it's buying it down to where it really is a remarkable discount off of the full cost of the premium. And then as you make more money, you pay a greater and greater portion until when you get to 400 percent of the federal poverty level. For a family of four, that's somewhere around $90,000 a year you then start bearing the full cost of the insurance that you purchase either through the marketplace or outside of the marketplace in the private sector. But sliding scale from essentially $15,000 for an individual up to $90,000 for a family of four, everybody in that corridor will potentially be able to get an advanced tax credit to help them buy the premiums down and make it be truly affordable. For a family of four, Andy just said it, but just to give you an idea of what had changed in the last decade, for a family of four, their insurance policy had grown from about $6,000 a year in 2000 to almost $12,000 a year in 2010. So do we expect really a person at you know, $30,000, $35,000 a year to be able to spend $12,000 of that on health insurance? Just doesn't work. So this is a sliding scale to give people help. They still have the responsibility to pay part of the premium and have cost sharing along with that. But as they make more and more, then they're able to take on more and more of that financial responsibility uh, as a family unit. Excuse me. <laughs> and everybody says, well, what is in this for me? Well, we've talked about what's in it for low-income people or people under 400% of the federal poverty level, which is most of our Kansans, 75% or more would hit that threshold. But all of us above that, will be helped also because on average we're paying about 1500 a year more in insurance premiums to help pay for those who have no coverage, to pay for the un uncompensated care. Somebody has to help pay those bills. So as people get healthier and everybody gets in, then the costs for everyone, including the full pay, will go down as well. 
And I guess that's also an argument to adults, uh, particularly those who work part-time, and particularly those in the 26 to 30-year-old age range who are trying to debate whether or not they should just pay the penalty or buy insurance. I mean, what do you say to those people? Well, I've never known when I was going to have a car wreck next, and I've never known when lightning was going to strike. And you never know, although they're young and invincible, I think you know, it is a need to have everybody in so that when those events do happen for our, our younger individuals, we have the coverage in place. Cindy has a, a plan that is a, a basic plan that's very affordable that I may ask you to give more of the details on. But I think that's part of the need for our outreach and education. This is not just about how do we get people that have conditions already covered, because you have to have the healthy in to be able to spread the risk to be able to afford the care. So this really has got to be about getting everybody to value health insurance regardless of your age, regardless of your need, and to find a pathway to help encourage those folks to sign up so that we can actually get most, if not all, of the eligible Arkansans under the tent so that we can care for them in advance before they're sick with preventive care and other things, and we can make sure that, that we have the fiscal resources available after they're sick so that we can get them the best, most efficient, high-quality care possible. You want to share on the younger folks what they may be interested in on your, on your savings? Well, there is a, what's called a, this isn't exactly what you're getting at yet, but a catastrophic plan that's available for those under 30 or those who would have to spend more than 8% of their income on insurance. And it has a higher deductible, and the premium is lower, but the coverage is not as good. For almost the same amount, you could get a bronze plan, which is a 60% insurance coverage of benefits, 40% pay by the consumer. And so it's probably almost as good. With the subsidies, a lot of people can buy down to that bronze coverage and have no premium costs. So it's really important that the individual do the shopping and looks, look at what's right for them by household size, by income, by age, because it does change, and that's why I'm hesitant to you know, throw out these numbers. But it is important that they shop, that they know which plan to choose, and then another very important piece before somebody is going to talk about the health savings account would be that Consumers are protected from those high cost events. And a part of this law that a lot of people don't know is there is an out-of-pocket maximum cost to individuals. So for an individual, that's about $6,350. For a family, it's $12,700. So that is my deductible, all my coinsurance, everything I have to pay won't cap that in a year. And that's very important because, you know, you have one premature baby over a million dollars and you're wiped out, you're bankrupt, you're, your whole future if you're a young person is gone. This way, most people can work toward getting a car that runs for six or $12,000 and pay it off in time and meet their responsibility. And that's what will happen. So besides having coverage that if you don't get in, you won't have, you have a maximum out-of-pocket expense for an individual or family that is somewhat reasonable that people can begin to pay off and not go bankrupt. Healthcare is the number one, number two cause of bankruptcy. And would you like to talk about the health savings accounts? I, 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 cer I certainly will. Um, let me, let me just add that uh, we've been really focused on the uh, question of uh, eligibility, enrollment, uh, financial consequences for those with incomes above poverty, in many cases above 138 percent of poverty. And another principle to understand, uh, the March 31st deadline for enrollment, uh, for taking personal responsibility, does not apply to individuals uh, who essentially are in poverty, who would, who would be participating in the private option. And a simple, simple way to remember that is um, that poverty is always a qualifying event for enrolling in uh, the private option. That's what it is there for. Poverty does not just hit during open enrollment. It might hit uh, midway through the year, et cetera. So uh, for those of you who are uh, sharing information with others who might be in that income range or who have a loss of job or income during the year, please, please remember that. One of the, uh, at, there, the, the 
Healthcare Independence Act, which, which underlies the private option uh, and, and passed here in Arkansas in the spring, includes uh, really a, a couple of phases of implementation. The waiver that was approved on Friday is the first phase and the largest uh, to expand coverage to uh, this new population of adults uh, that is currently not eligible for, uh, for any public uh, assistance or, or subsidy for health care. Uh, up to upwards of a quarter million. The second phases of the Healthcare Independence Act are the next policy challenge that we'll be engaging in uh, uh, at the state level uh, and ultimately with the federal government. And that is to, uh, to enter into a pilot program to explore the use of health savings accounts or similar sort of high deductible but also subsidized savings account programs for the poor. Now, obviously, the principal challenge is um, there's no savings account if you're poor uh, to begin with, and that's so. That's one of the aspects of this, which is a which engenders it to a pilot program, and that that savings account would have to be subsidized. But with that, uh, the possibility uh, that we could see uh, different behavior uh, or learning uh, for those who are still in poverty, and of course, many who are in poverty work their way out. Many young people in poverty do not stay there. Uh, for their adult lives, uh, that they may learn uh, sort of the value of dollars if they're facing the choice. Again, the immediate out-of-pocket cost that they would um, incur, but they could pay it out of a subsidized account, which otherwise they could use for other, for other means. This is, this is the math that those of us with money can already engage in. Uh, this is a new math for the poor, and it's going to be part of a pilot program that we'll seek uh, approval for uh, and develop next. Let's take some questions from the audience and we ask that the questions be concise and the answers be concise so we can get as many in as possible. I see a hand uh, right over there in the please, back. Please wait for the microphones to reach you. Thank you uh, for your presentation. I'd like to ask a question. I hear something from the guest in the middle, guest speaker, regarding a maximum coverage level, depending on which plan you take between bronze and platinum. It was my understanding that the Affordable Care Act did away with limitations on coverage. Would you please explain the difference? Yes. There are no lifetime or annual benefit limits, so no dollar limits on coverage beginning January 1, 14. What I was speaking to is the maximum out-of-pocket expense by the consumer. So the plan can pay a greater benefit according to what the consumer needs in health care, but the consumer's contribution is maxed. Question right there in the back, lady in the blue. Hi, I'm Allie Rouse. I'm a third-year law student, second-year Clinton student. And I know this is going to affect several people in the room, so I'm going to ask. I turned 26 two weeks after I graduated law school in the Clinton School, but I'm under my parents' insurance right now. What do I need to do to make sure that I have coverage? And do you have any tips? When do you turn 26? May 23rd. May 23rd. You could that would be a qualifying event because you would lose coverage. And therefore, there are certain life qualifying events that allow you to come in outside of open enrollment if you're not under 138% when you can come in any time. So for you, losing coverage would be a qualifying event. You could come in in May. And if you don't have a qualifying event and you waited too long? If you don't have a qualifying event, you wait until the next open enrollment period, which will be October of 14. So unless you have a birth, a death, marriage, divorce, lose your job, have something very big happen, um, you will be out of coverage until October. And I guess have to pay those penalties. Penalties are accrued if you do not have coverage for at least nine months in the calendar year. So you have a three-month grace period, but if you're not covered for nine months, you will have a penalty. I think the, the more likely event is you'll have to pay the hospital bill. Okay. That's a penalty. Big bill. <laughs> uh, the lady in the blue and then the lady in the, the pink. Is 
the out-of-pocket maximum an annual out-of-pocket maximum? Because yes. for someone with an adjusted gross income of 27000 who has an ongoing illness, that sounds like a high out-of-pocket maximum. That is the maximum. So depending on how many were in that household, they may have no out-of-pocket expense. So we'd have to look at a chart, but 27000 for two uh, would have them paying some out-of-pocket expenses, and the maximum would change so that they should not pay. No one should pay more than 9.5% for their premium, but they have other out-of-pocket expenses, and that goes all the way down to zero or 2%, 3% on a sliding scale fee. So. I'm not sure how to answer precisely. The maximum does sound like a lot for that income, but a lot better than what we've had before this. I think it's worth taking just a second to make sure we're all grounded on the metallic plans and the essential health benefit. Essentially, the insurance department has, with lots of input, established what is called the essential health benefit, so that it's a complete benefit package. And all the plans, for the most part, they have to offer everything that's in the essential health benefit package. Some can put a few bells and whistles on top of that, but it's all going to cover a complete insurance package. And then what the individual chooses, to, how much they want responsibility versus the insurance plan. A bronze plan has more, a lower premium, but more out of pockets. And then it goes up. Silver, gold, a platinum plan has a much higher premium. You're paying more for it in your premium and you're protected from out of pockets. So somebody who has one or more serious illnesses is probably going to want to buy, if they can, a higher level plan that protects them from out-of-pocket exposure rather than a bronze plan for probably healthier folks who are more willing to take that risk uh, or younger folks that are more willing to take. So, so that's the setup, I think. Bronze, silver, gold, platinum for the same benefit. And the trade-off is how much you're paying in premium versus how much you're taking in risk on co-payments, co-insurance, or deductibles. The woman back here. Thank you again for coming and having this uh, program for us. Uh, you've mentioned younger people and you've mentioned families, but what about seniors on Medicare? Will supplement insurance be part of the exchange? So, so I want to deal with a few of the pieces of misinformation, whether intentional or not, I'll leave up to your judgment. This doesn't change any of the Medicare benefit. It doesn't change any of the supplemental benefit, with two exceptions. One is for seniors. All clinical preventive services are now to be available at no copayment and no financial barrier. So in the past, if you had to pay a copayment for your mammogram, or if your cholesterol screening, some of those things, now those are to have no financial barrier for seniors at all. And the prescription drug donut hole is being closed over time. Most seniors felt that closure last year by 20%, and each year it scales down another 20%. But we've done a few phone calls with the AARP that for Medicare folks, you're good as far as the Accountable Care Act goes to sequester is cutting provider payments. So that's separate. The sequester is hurting Medicare beneficiaries on access because it's cut cutting provider payments. The other piece that I would add is for the 55 to 64 year olds, which is what the AARP was really targeting our outreach efforts to, enormous help. Somebody who's 62, their husband's keeping a job just so they can stay on the husband's insurance coverage because the wife has a serious set of conditions. Now the wife can go to the marketplace and the insurance options on the marketplace can no longer use pre-existing conditions to tell them that they can't get access to health insurance coverage. There was the gentleman in the yellow, then the gentleman in the front, and then the gentleman there. We'll finish up. Thank you. Could you help me understand the individual incentives to purchase ins insurance or to continue my current coverage, given that now I can purchase insurance if I have a pre if something happen if I don't have insurance and something happens to me, then I can buy insurance, unlike automobile insurance. I'm just trying to understand the economics of that. Because sometimes it's criticized yeah. as drive-by insurance, stuff like that. Could you help us understand that? Yeah. So you, you hit the fundamental nail on the head. You don't get to buy car insurance after you have a wreck. You don't get to buy homeowner's insurance after the tree falls on your house. 
but we want you to be able to buy health insurance after you've had cancer or a heart attack so that we can help you get that. So the fundamental business model for health insurance just really has never worked. What this does is it encourages people on the front end through a tax credit to buy in to what they can trust is a standard benefit package and for which they get to choose how much risk they want to take. Over time, the penalty does scale up. Cindy mentioned the first year it's $90 uh, and it ends up scaling up to $695, $695 in the second year. And, and so there is a penalty that scales up. I would say it probably is not from my personal perspective, a strong enough penalty incentive over time. I would also suggest that if the penalty doesn't work, it may get ratcheted up. There is no nothing that prohibits a state from putting a penalty in for non-participation. Uh, so you know, I can envision where we do ratchet the penalty phase up if we don't get the participation. But the encouragement is to have people do that math to say, while I really could stay out, I will have more peace of mind and more assurance for myself and my family by taking advantage of the tax credit early on, getting in, getting hooked, and then having a broader base of insurance to help pay for those that need care uh, today. I would just also point out that uh, f for those above 138% of poverty, uh, enrollment's not immediate. Costs are incurred uh, immediately upon the onset of some acute or high cost event very quickly. Uh, so if you face the 45-day wait, which is the maximum for enrollment, um, and let's say you're not able to enroll the day that you show up in the ER, uh, then you're looking at 45 days, uh, as, much as, four, as many as 45 days of incurring enormous cost. You're bankrupt by the time you get to that next, uh, the beginning of that next month. Now that's a difficult concept, I think. It takes a fair amount of background to understand what I just said. So again, we have a tremendous communication uh, challenge so that, so that our citizens understand uh, the cost involved in the healthcare system, how to avoid them, how to be personally responsible, how to take advantage. I would just add, just for, and Cindy, correct me if I'm wrong, but open enrollment above 138 for, for non-private option tax credit supported individuals starts tomorrow and it goes through March 31st and then it closes. If you don't have the birth of a child or the death of a spouse or something, you don't get to come back in until the next November. Is it November, October 1? It'll be October 15th next year. October 15th. Keep and, changing the rules. And next year, open enrollment closes on December 31st, so it narrows down the open. December 7th next year. It's going to be a really short window next year. Shorter than even I thought yeah. about it. <laughs> so anyway, I think the door is wide open and the encouragement is to get in in the next six months. It is going to start to ratchet down both in terms of when you can come in, and I predict that the penalties, if we have non, a significant amount of non-participation, will get ratcheted up over time so that it does make it to your financial advantage as well as your responsibility to participate. We're down to our last two questions, and then we're going to close it out. And it was this gentleman and the gentleman back there. Thank you, and I think this is a question for Cindy. I was talking to a, a family over the weekend, a uh, family of four, both parents just turned 30, have had a comprehensive policy, 471 a month. Uh, they learned through the tables, I'm talking to the insurance company, to keep the same policy, they can grandfather in for 2014, but to keep the same policy starting in 2015 is going to cost almost $1,000 a month with higher co-pays. So, you know, they asked me, well, you know, is this the way it works? Is this right? And it seems to me that if you're just over 400% of poverty, which they are, buying their own policy, that they're getting slammed with a 100% increase. I mean, what, what would you tell them uh, in, in that situation? What kind of advice would you give? That's a hard question. Um, I don't know what they were getting for $471 a month. But it, it did not include the same benefits. So we're not really comparing apples to apples because now we have 10 essential health benefits, many that weren't covered before. Um, I don't know enough about their situation. They would be eligible to shop in the exchange even if they got no subsidies. So they'd have to look at the costs of different plans. Um, and, and it's hard to comment, it sounds terrible that they would have 100%, but I think we may have some missing information. 
I would just add that by definition, uh, the existing and broken insurance system that we have does have a few winners. Uh, those who are able to prove to the insurance companies and the underwriters that they're not uh, expected to have high costs the next year, they may win. And because no one else can afford to participate in the marketplace, it looks as if insurance isn't costly. Uh, but I promise you, the insurance is probably more costly. They're probably paying more to protect against the real average risk for their demographic than they will under the marketplace. And what they're really benefiting from right now is an incredibly favorable health status uh, and, and risk selection in the marketplace. Um, and that's a societal question. Is that what we really want? So could there be winners under the existing system? Yes. They, um, they are um, outnumbered by orders of magnitude uh, by the winners under the new system. Okay. Uh, the gentleman right there in the back. And, and as he gets the mic, I think it's important to note that uh, if you didn't have your question answered, remember to go to arhealthconnector.org and also healthcare.gov and Commissioner Crone. There are some important numbers that people should know as well. Yes. Uh, let, get out your pencils and paper. Uh, the Federal Call Center open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, starting at 12.01 tomorrow morning, is 1-800-318-2590. I'll do that again quickly, 1-800-318-2596. We also have an Arkansas Health Connector Resource Center for Arkansas-specific questions, or if you can't get what you need, that number is 855-283-3483. That's at Arkansas Insurance Department, 855-283-3483. We may not know your answer, but we'll get it for you, and then we'll know the next caller how to answer for them. It's, we're all learning. Go ahead, sir. Uh, my, my question is, uh, being a full-time student over 26 years, or an un unemployed person will get free coverage? Could you repeat it uh, one more time? Uh, will a, sorry, uh, will a full-time student over 26 years old, or an unemployed person will get free coverage under the new system? So um, under the new system beginning in January, the idea is that individuals will, um, uh, will pay a premium and or cost sharing, out-of-pocket costs, that's proportional to their income. Uh, that's not true today. So it depends on uh, how much income that individual has. If it's less than, if, if it's less than 138% of the federal poverty level, there will be no premium. Uh, there'll be no premium. There, there will be some cost sharing at the upper end of that range. Above 138% of poverty, the premiums go up gradually, and the cost sharing goes up a little more than gradually, a fairly steep rise to 250%. The cost sharing maxes out at 250 or percent of poverty. So um, for the first time, what, the definition of affordable, why is that word in the name of the act as it was originally named? Uh, and, and that is an implicit definition of what we can afford, and it's proportional to income. And I would just add, you know, and I, I say this at every event that I'm at, for anyone who is about to make a purchasing decision, wait 24 more hours so that you see what all of your options are, because there will be, for the first time, most of us have only had the option that our employer offered. I have never had a choice of a health insurance plan, except for one, the one my employer offered. And I've never worked for an employer that offered two. Tomorrow, people on the marketplace, at least in some of the service areas, are going to have a choice of four. So the next six months is about, or seven, that's right, 17 plans, four carriers. So we are about to have, for the first time, choice inserted into our individual pursuit of health insurance coverage. And I think you've got folks out there that are saying you've got to rush to sign up today or before December 31st where our job collectively, and I want to share it with you, is to make sure that everybody avails themselves of information so that they make the best choice for themselves and their family. Ladies and gentlemen, Dean Rutherford to close us out. Well, let's, uh, let's give the panel a round of applause.
You know, when we, when we started, uh, Cindy, talking about partnering with you all for the marketplace tomorrow, we did research on two uh, previous uh, similar, though different initiatives, but, but we learned. One was the Massachusetts health care plan that Governor Romney uh, championed and implemented in 2006. And the second one was the uh, Medicare drug provision that President Bush championed. In both of those, on the Massachusetts plan, uh, the vast majority of the folks signed up at or near the deadline. But now 98% of the people in Massachusetts are covered. The vast majority of those signing up for the Medicare drug plan signed at or near the deadline. Now 30 million Americans are taking advantage of that. So tomorrow, the, the choice you never can make is the choice you never heard of. And tomorrow you get to hear about choices in health care. I want to thank Andy, Cindy, and Joe, and Malcolm for a great job. See you tomorrow at 10 o'clock. <laughs>